So good morning, everybody. Uh, I see there are 25 of you so far. We're expecting four times that. Uh, but good morning to, the, to you, uh, to those who've already joined us. For those of you who don't know, I'm Michael Gibbons. I'm chairman of Elexon and indeed the BSC panel. And by the way, currently an extremely frustrated squash player. It is my pleasure and privilege to welcome everybody to this seminar, uh, and which I think will be a very interesting and insightful one on behalf of the Energy Institute. And if anybody is unaware of who the Energy Institute is, I'm sure there aren't many, but just in case, the Energy Institute is an independent network of professionals spanning the whole energy system. It convenes and it facilitates debates like this one, bringing together expertise so that energy can be better understood, managed and valued. And that is exactly our purpose uh, today and indeed the purpose of all the debates in this series. Uh, it's good to have the expectation of so many on the call. Um, and this is the first virtual debate in the series. Um, I emphasize two key uh, uh, features of these debates. There's normally three, I'll come to that. The first is that we have three good, indeed very good speakers, as you can see. The second is that these sessions allow the opportunity for a very good question and answer session as well. Uh, and uh, in fact, there should be at least 30 minutes, if not significantly more available for questions. So the combination of three great speakers and a really good opportunity to interact is what we're looking forward to. Unfortunately, today we have to dispense with the third feature of our policy debate series which is a good networking lunch. And let's hope we can do that again in the foreseeable future. So having said that questions are an important part of this series, can I please make it very clear how you should be asking questions? Uh, so please ensure that the, listen carefully to the instruction, which is click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen, select the host, uh, Energy Institute from the drop down, and all questions will then come directly to me and I'll put them to the panel. Only one of the three speakers has slides, and you can have them. Uh, I, I think the other piece of housekeeping is the avoidance of doubt. You, you the audience, will not be on camera, uh, you won't have access to audio, and there won't be a hands up facility. However, the event is recorded. So uh, at this point, I normally move on and introduce the subject for the seminar. Today, uh, I think I, I shall dispense with that because I don't think I can improve on just a few words of what the speakers are going to say so that you know how the, the, the morning will pan out. The first speaker will be Peter Atherton, whom I'll introduce in a minute or so. And he'll offer some comments on how the retail market has developed, some reflections on successes and failures of some of the players, the comings and goings, and some financial comments on the health of the companies. After uh, Peter, we will go on to uh, Anthony Pygram, and he will also reflect on how the market is currently changing and prospectively changing. He may well offer some reflections on the price cap and on impacts of COVID. And when he's spoken, uh, we will have Sarah Vaughan, and she will also comment on the changing structure of the retail market. Uh, she'll make some comparisons with other markets, uh, offer some comments on the COVID impacts, but her theme will very much be the health of the market. One final point before I introduce the first speaker. All questions arising and general cross-cutting cross questions from the audience we will take together at the end of the third speaker's presentation. So that the three speakers then form a panel uh, to answer the questions that you ask. However, if you are unclear or indeed have not understood uh, what any speaker has said, the time to, e to ask that question, a clarifying question, is at the end, well, at the time of that speaker's presentation. Uh, and I will seek to ensure that any clarifying question, but only a clarifying question, is taken at the end 
of that speaker's presentation. So I do trust all is clear. As I say, if you have questions, click on the chat, select the Energy Institute host and ask your question by typing it in. All being well, we'll proceed now to the first speaker, who's Peter Atherton. Uh, I think he's known uh, quite well to many of you, if not all of you. His career includes uh, the National Grid. Uh, in 1996, he joined the investment bank Climate Benson at uh, privatization time. In 2000, he joined Citigroup and, and spent uh, a number of years there. Uh, in 2016, he left the city, now has a number of advisory roles, including uh, the Guggenheim Investment Bank, uh, the corporate strategy consultant Stonehaven, and FTI Consulting. Peter. As ever, we're looking forward to hearing from you. The floor is yours. The history of the uh, of the retail sector. Um, I've been an observer of it um, for uh, for its entire history, actually, uh, given that it wasn't uh, really created until the late 1990s as a competitive market. Um, I've been involved as a banker with a number of the companies, um, both the um, the, uh, the legacy players, as you might call them, and um, and, and new players. Um, and I've been fascinated, truly fascinated, actually, to see this market develop over the years. Uh, so I'm going to touch on a few things. I'm going to go through the, the sort of history of the market, um, look at how the market developed um, into the market we have today from about 2015. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask the question, how do you make money in the retail market? Um, I've got any great answers to that, by the way, but I'm um, going to ask that question. Uh, and then I'm going to finish with um, just two or three points, which I think are the good points and the bad points of the current market. But remember, I'm always coming at this, but if you like, from a financial angle. Uh, so if we look at the history of the retail market, um, for those of us who were around at the time, we can remember that it was a sort of an odd business. Uh, the sort of all the retail businesses were owned originally by the uh, regional uh, distribution companies, and they didn't really know what to do with them, wasn't sure whether they're going to be profit centers uh, or sort of, you know, a, a liability. Um, and in that first sort of decade from about 96, 97 to um, 2003, 2004, actually three business models um, were developed. One really big one that dominated and two, two more niche models. So the, the main business model developed in the first decade of this market was the vertically integrated model. So what we saw was the vast majority of the UK retail uh, energy businesses were, were acquired by generators uh, who saw the advantage of being vertically integrated. And really what they, what the, what they had realized by about 97, 98 was that um, uh, generation profits were going to be very volatile, very linked to the wholesale uh, market, therefore going to be volatile. And what they envisaged was that the profitability from generation that uh, would fall um, when wholesale prices declined uh, would need to pass through the retail business. And at the time, it's probably difficult to remember at the time, most retailers didn't change their prices more than once or even or, or twice a year at most. So profits from generation would sit within retail for a period of time before they were passed on to the consumer. And that would allow the generators to smooth the volatility that they were seeing in the in the wholesale market. And that's why we saw a real move by the major generators to acquire um, to acquire retail business and the vertical integrated business model was, was born. We also saw another model, which was the multi-brand model, which was uh, Centrica's model. And Centrica uh, saw itself as a sort of mass market retailer with a brand of British Gas, and it put it uh, side by side that with several other brands. If you remember, it bought the AA, it set up OneTel, actually bought OneTel, sorry, so the telecoms brand and set up uh, goldfish. Um, at the time, people are often talking about this was a multi-brand cross-selling strategy. Reality, it wasn't. The Hendrick actually didn't, really didn't try that. What they envisaged was that they would be able to combine the back office systems of all these brands, have 100 million uh, customers sitting on a sort of joint system uh, or very few systems, and that would build in um, uh, competitive advantage through economies of scale. What they found after about six, seven years of trying to do this was that it didn't really work. And then they decided to break that up and go back to being a sort of an energy, uh, an energy centered um, company and energy brand. Often wonder actually whether they should have stuck at that uh, and whether it might have been uh, more successful because when they were trying it, it was of course right at the very early days of the internet. We also saw the development of some niche uh, uh, retailers at that point, very first focus on green, 
energy. So we saw the likes of Ecotricity and Good Energy, which I'm very pleased to say are still with us today, um, uh, develop into the market. But it was a market dominated for a good 10 to 15 years by the vertically integrated uh, model. We did see some independents coming, some quite large independents. There was a company called Independent Energy, which for a while was um, quite a success with a billion two market cap at one point. Uh, until, uh, until unfortunately they over expanded, um, their uh, billing system couldn't cope and they crashed and burned. Um, throughout the OOs, uh, it was a market as they dominated really by the vertically integrated business model. Um, and uh, we didn't see very many uh, new players enter until about 2010. And probably two reasons for this. Um, one is we had seen some independents come in and not do very well. And, and secondly, um, the barriers to entry were really high. So difficult to do CRM, difficult to do trading, difficult to do billing. Um, and also working capital was the really uh, big one. Um, uh, don't forget, uh, until relatively recently, customers um, expected to pay in arrears. And it was really the innovation um, pioneered by some companies, but really taken forward by Ovo uh, to get customers to pay up front that really solved the working capital issue. Just for the working capital issue in, in, in some perspective, it was not unusual in that sort of 2008, 9, 10 period, for example, for Centrica to have a negative working capital over the winter in its retail business of, of £2 billion. Pounds. So working capital and the fact that customers tend to pay you in arrears was a really big barrier to, barrier to entry. But around about that 2010 period, we saw those barriers fall, and in fact, then fall to incredibly uh, low levels. And that gets us into the sort of position we've been in from sort of 2014, 15 onwards to where we sort of are today, where we've seen uh, the, the rise of um, disruptive new entrants, which have managed to get some scale, and lots and lots and lots of um, micro and uh, niche and mini uh, entrants. Um, I have to say, from a um, capital markets perspective, the um, last six, seven, eight years has been a sort of vortex of capital destruction. Uh, we have seen the vast majority of uh, supply companies uh, lose money, and many of the major players uh, have also been loss making for significant portions of the last six and seven years. Lots of different reasons for that, and I'll touch on one or two of them. Um, uh, but nevertheless, is is a fact. Um, uh, looking at the economics of some of the players which have entered the market in the last um, five, six, seven years or so, um, they've been extremely poor. Uh, companies have gone for market share, um, regardless of profitability, um, which is very uh, disruptive for the uh, other players in the market, uh, and they have bared through capital often at a very uh, prodigious. Uh, rate. Uh, I have to say, looking at the accounts of uh, of a few of the players in the market today, um, uh, I would say that some of these companies are actually closer to being Ponzi schemes than they are to being sustainably economic or, or profit making. I'm not suggesting they are Ponzi schemes. I'm just saying on a spectrum of um, of sustainability, uh, they are um, at the far end. And I've looked at some accounts where I'm actually genuinely amazed the auditors have signed them off as being uh, going concerns. And I would point out that um, some companies are almost pride themselves um, on their ability to burn through capital uh, because it gains you growth. And of course, that can work and it can be successful. And I'll touch on that in a, in a second. Uh, but by and large, um, anybody can build up market share if you're willing to sell your product at a loss. It is not, you're not, creating economic value by and large by doing that. Some companies can and do, but they typically have a very good reason for gaining market share because they're adding value somewhere. And in, and in a commodity uh, retail business, which is what we're talking about here, uh, by just selling the commodity at a loss, um, even if that gains you market share, I do not believe for one second that that is creating any form of, of economic value. Um, so, asking the question then, how do you make money uh, in, um, in retail supply? Well, I think it's fairly obvious that what you don't do is just sell the commodity. I think if, you, if your business is just selling the commodity, given the nature of the business and given the competitive environment around the business, um, it is um, probably next to impossible uh, to actually make money um, because of the um, uh, because you're faced with dozens of competitors who are willing to lose money, as simple as that. 
Um, so how on earth can you secure um, sustainable gross margins um, to both be profitable, but also in a decent return on capital by just selling the quality? So it's got to be um, commodity plus. You've got to be doing something other than just uh, selling the commodity. And we are seeing, you know, some really interesting um, innovations there. Um, uh, Octopus is a good example. Um, recently uh, was in the headlines because they took some investment from Origin uh, from Australia, which normally valued the business around a billion dollars. Didn't quite uh, do that in my reading of it, but nevertheless, um, I'm showing something. But what, what was, if you read the press releases, what was Origin actually buying into? Well, they were uh, not really buying into the uh, quality business, what they were buying into was the uh, Kraken uh, platform, the software that Octopus has put together. It really reminded me actually of Okado, the um, grocery home delivery uh, company whose business today is actually less about delivering groceries. It's actually selling their warehousing software and platforms to, uh, to other companies. It struck me that Oct Octopus was doing uh, something like that. We've still got you know niche players like um, Ecotricity Good, um, uh, who are um, offering a, a very much a, a green wraparound to, to their products, which is your know, people are willing to pay um, a, a premium for. Ovo has been successful through um, uh, lots of different routes. Uh, we're still seeing some um, supply businesses uh, as effectively a route to market, which is you know where Opus Energy comes in for uh, for Drax. So there are various business models out there which appear to be are creating some value, um, not always profits um, at the moment, but nevertheless value uh, in terms of um, uh, what uh, what people are willing to pay for the shares. Um, but certainly selling the commodity itself um, shows no sign of being able to create sustainable value and returns on uh, return on capital. I'd say this is not all the company's fault. Um, you know, we have seen a lot of companies enter this market in the last few years on the anticipation that uh, they would be able to do some very innovative things uh, around the sort of digitization of of the the, the industry and the and uh, and um, and the relationship with the customer through smart meters and are very um, uh, shall we say hesitant and um, not smooth uh, rollout of uh, smart meters and everything associated with it um, has stymied those those business models and those innovations. So um, if we would have been successfully delivering the digitalization of the sector, but I think we would have seen more innovation and more value added uh, coming in. Unfortunately, that has not been always uh, possible. Um, just looking at my time, I will then finish with my uh, good uh, and my bad of the sector at the moment. Um, the good, uh, well, for the consumers, um, you know, is losing a lot of money and destroying a lot of uh, capital has been pretty good for them because that capital has been um, uh, largely transferred to them. Uh, so from the consumer's perspective, obviously not always great when your supply goes bust and you have to transfer, et cetera. But nevertheless, by and large, um, uh, consumers have been getting a, a lower bill, um, or certainly those willing to switch have been getting lower bills uh, than, they, than they probably otherwise would do. Uh, we have seen some innovation. I don't think the I think uh, the innovation is often exaggerated. Um, uh, if you look at really what customers are getting today compared to what they got five years ago or ten years ago, is it really that different? Um, in a lot of cases, um, innovation is, is certainly struggling to go faster than the digitization of the sector. Um, but as that eventually is delivered, hopefully it will be. Um, then innovation uh, can grow, but they are benefiting from some uh, some innovation. Uh, the bad things, um, capital destruction. Uh, as I say, it's been a vortex of capital destruction over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, we have seen, as well as the transfer of wealth to uh, customers, there's also been a considerable transfer of wealth to management teams. Um, uh, most management teams, even companies who have gone bust, have paid themselves extremely well. Um, before they go bust, and um, lots of companies are paying themselves, paying their management teams based on revenue growth, not return on capital or profitability, which is fine up to a point, and it's fine in some circumstances, but overall, most of these companies will never earn a decent return, most of them will never earn a profit, uh, and therefore, those management teams are just being paid faculty to burn through other people's, uh, other people's cash. 
Um, uh, and um, we have a market at the moment that, despite the recent shakeout, um, uh, and I'm sure um, you know, often I'm going to talk about how they're addressing this, but we do have a, a market at the moment which is um, populated by lots of very undercapitalized companies, and um, undercapitalized both financially, uh, but also with human capital as well. I, you know, I personally, I've said this for many years, I just don't think there's enough uh, people who really understand has the skill set to desupply really well to populate 60 companies. I think, you know, we've probably got enough uh, you know, people to populate 20 or 30 companies at best, certainly not, uh, uh, certainly not 60 or so. Um, I think I'm dead on my 15 minutes, Michael, so I shall finish you there. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. Uh, we haven't received, at least as yet, any questions for clarification. It seems to me you've been very clear. Uh, you've got us off to a great start. Thank you by, uh, I think uh, it's fair to say, raising a number of questions uh, around the health of the energy retail market. I know that we shall return and possibly keep returning to that theme. Uh, since there are no questions on clarification, I'll thank you. We'll come back to you in the panel time, and I'll move on to introducing Anthony Pygram, who is the Director of Conduct and Enforcement at Ofgem. Uh, in the early uh, part of his career, he uh, uh, was uh, an employee at the Department of Trade and Industry, as it then was in various posts moved on to the Competition uh, Commission uh, and joined Ofgem in 2018. Uh, sorry, joined, joined Ofgem earlier than that, but became Director of Con for Conduct and Enforcement at Ofgem in April 18. As such, he is responsible for Ofgem's oversight of what is happening in the retail and wholesale market, so absolutely central to our subject today. Uh, and uh, his activity includes taking action to prevent or address problems arising, and he's responsible for all of Ofgem's enforcement activity. So with that, uh, Anthony, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Over to you. Thank you very much, Michael, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about something that Peter touched on, which is that it's hard to make a profit in this market. Now, um, in 2018 and well, since January 2018, I think there have been 19 companies exit the market through our supply of last resort process. Um, they varied in size enormously. Um, there was one company which had uh, 80 non-domestic customers. Uh, the biggest one uh, was Spark, which had 290,000 customer accounts. We've had two others with over 200,000 accounts, uh, Economy uh, Energy and Extra Energy. That's a lot of failures. Um, why have they happened? Well, it's probably a variety of reasons. Um, we've seen um, uh, maybe unsustainable attempts at large scale growth. Uh, we've seen, frankly, poor governance. We have seen um, maybe business models that aren't, aren't really gonna work. Um, so I, you know, I, I, down to um, a business model based on a certain nationality of customer. So we've seen some very different business models, but we've seen a lot of failures. We've also seen at least half a dozen trade sales in the last couple of years, uh, ranging from the very small up to um, uh, a couple of reasonably sized ones um, last year, co-op, early this year, Orange's domestic arm, and of course, most recently, um, SSE's domestic arm being acquired by Ovo. Um, why are there so many supplies in the market and why are so many failing? It's hard to know. If I was to posit a personal guess, I would say the big increase in number of suppliers coincided with a decision made uh, around about 2014 or 15, I think it was, to um, uh, require all price comparison websites that were members of the um, Austrian Confidence Code to show all tariffs um, and not just tariffs that you could switch to from that site. In effect, if you had a market leading tariff, you got free advertising. Um, and fairly soon after that, we started to see a spike in entrance. So it may have something to do with that. I don't know. Um, but it's hard to make a profit. There is a price cap in place. We put a price cap in place. We will be announcing the latest level of it um, in, I think, two weeks' time, in the beginning of August. Um, and that is to set 
an efficient price for energy such that consumers get a fair price. Now, that's not a market leading price, but it's a fair price. Um, when we put it in place, we expect the price differential to go down between um, price cap standard tariffs and other tariffs, and it hasn't, which suggests um, to me uh, that there are probably, as Peter suggested, tariffs um, that are loss leading in the market. Uh, one supplier has told me that they are offering a target um, in the last few months, that they're offering a tariff which is close to market leading on which they are not making a loss. Um, I don't think there are many others, uh, which is interesting because competition um, in that part of the market really is for is on price and it's for a group of customers who certainly with what's going on at the moment are not really expanding in number so what you're getting is customers switching to a cheapest tariff or one of the cheapest tariffs on the market it's not clear to me that many of those customers then think you know what well, I'll stick around for a second year and let them price me at the cap so it's quite difficult to make a, a profit when you're selling a tariff which is um, very cheap almost certainly loss leading, and then you've got an efficient um, price cap in place. Now, COVID has not made things easy at all this year for anybody. I suppose the first thing to say is that um, suppliers have done a good job for consumers. Uh, they reached an agreement with Bayes, they implemented that agreement, they have done good stuff for consumers. So if you are a representative of a, a supplier this morning, um, let me once again say thank you. Um, some suppliers were probably readier than others. There was one supplier who told us, I can't remember if it was one week or two weeks before lockdown, that they were sending their staff to work from home um, so that they were ready, predicting it. And another supplier told me a couple of weeks into lockdown that they were going around trying to buy laptops so they'd get their um, staff who were at home working. Um, but even then it's fraught. So if you're working from home and you have small children, it is quite difficult to um, be part of a call center efficiently. Um, and of course, overseas call centres and back office functions are uh, realities for several suppliers. The problem there is that usually if you've got a problem in the UK, that's the solution. But where you've got a, a worldwide pandemic, you have different regulatory regimes, different governments, um, different impacts. So if you have a call centre in, let's just say, South Africa, um, what's happening in South Africa may not mimic what's happening in the UK, but all of a sudden UK service um, uh, goes down because you've had to close your call centre at South Africa at no notice. So it's been a really difficult time and consumers have done a good job, um, suppliers have done a good job in trying to make sure that consumers are, are looked after in that time. But of course consumers are affected. Um, now at this point I was going to give you some stats over what we've seen over the last few months. I'm going to try and remember what they were but I'm afraid my notes are stuck in the ether on the off-gem system so I, you cannot take these numbers as, as, as gospel. Um, we saw a peak in uh, emergency credit given by suppliers to domestic customers around about the 30th of March. Um, that was quite a sharp peak, went down quite quickly, and we are back down at the levels of emergency credit that typically um, suppliers give to customers in winter. So that's the sort of level we're at now um, across the market. Other metrics also peaked at around about the end of March, the very beginning of April. Um, but maybe been slightly slower to come down, for example, things like um, direct debit cancellations um, or direct debit uh, failing. Um, in the non-domestic space, we saw a very big immediate spike when lockdown happened of um, cancelled direct debits. That probably reflects um, companies not being able to open and furloughing staff and closing their offices. Um, it's been much lower since then. We have seen sort of monthly spikes in um, uh, failed or um, cancelled direct debits, which probably relate to the end of the month. But the, the numbers of those have been coming down month on month quite noticeably. Um, in non domestic, it's particularly important to realise, um, to, to remember that actually, with reduction in places being open, that means less energy being used, which means less revenue for suppliers but also how to sell back to the market at a thumping loss, um, energy that um, they, they contracted to buy because they were expecting the companies to use it and then aren't using it. So a double whammy for non-domestic suppliers. We're expecting an increase in debt in both for domestic and non-domestic customers. Um, suppliers should always work hard to put customers on affordable repayment plans, 
um, and help them get back on their feet. But it is likely that we're going to see an increase in debt, which over, comes, over time becomes bad debt um, over this winter. Uh, it's questionable whether how many customers, um, suppliers will survive, but it's likely that some will go out of business. Main trick of that will probably be like the last couple of years, the renewables obligation that falls due at the end of August with a late payment date at the end of October. Um, in the last two sessions of the renewables obligation, we've had to issue or consult on five final orders. We've put two provisional orders in place. Uh, we've opened two investigations. Um, we've seen five companies actually pay back the money that they were at risk of not paying because of that action, but other suppliers are uh, unfortunately going out of business because they weren't able to pay that. Um, we've got the, uh, the, the changes that we introduced in the licensing review, which means that companies coming into the market should be better placed to survive in the market, to have a, a, a sort of uh, a, a, a plan that will work for them. Uh, but we have a lot of suppliers in the market and it is likely that some of them will either seek to sell their customer book to other suppliers, seek to merge with other suppliers, or just may go out of business um, this autumn. Don't know how many, but there will almost certainly be some. Final point I want to touch on is that this has been an incredibly challenging time, but it is a chance for a restart. Um, and there's been a lot of talk generally about this being a, a green restart, bearing in mind the government's um, target of uh, achieving net zero by 2050. Um, I suppose what the first thing that struck me about COVID uh, is prepayment meters um, and how it is difficult when you're self-isolating to get out to the shop to top up. But actually, if you've got a smart prepayment meter, then it should have been an awful lot easier and there must be some way we can build on the, the positivity of smart meters around COVID um, to help increase rollout and increase acceptance um, of smart meters. Second thing I think is, it's important to get clarity on what is green. Um, there are various definitions of, of what, are, what is green energy, what are green tariffs. Um, I, I, we've seen suppliers go overnight from supplying 3% green energy to 100% green energy. Um, because of the way the, the current rules are, are, are defined. It, that doesn't really feel like a credible position and I wonder how, whether that is really something we should be focusing on and looking to better define green. Um, and finally, my final point is we need to engage consumers on this journey. And um, if you go back three or four years, we were saying people wouldn't switch for £250 saving the amount of money they're likely to save by going green is quite a lot less than that. How are we going to engage them? That's a real challenge going forwards. Michael, I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much indeed, Anthony. Uh, again, very clear to me. I don't have yet any questions of clarification on that. Uh, I took as uh, the theme, if you like, for what you were talking about right at the beginning, uh, the statement that it is hard to make money in this market. And I'm sure the questions uh, will flow around that subject later. Uh, so with no further ado, yes, I'm, it's confirmed there are no, no clarifying questions, Anthony. So thank you for that. Uh, uh, and we'll see you again in the panel. And I'll move on to introducing Sarah Vaughan. Uh, Sarah Vaughan is the Political and Regulatory Affairs Director at E.ON in the UK and she's a non-executive director at one of the finest companies that exist, um, Alexon. Uh, she started her career as a lawyer at Slaughter and May, moved to Powergen as it then was, and subsequently added and added and added to her responsibilities, taking on regulation, compliance, energy policy and external affairs, uh, health and safety, legal and company secretariat. I could go on. Sarah. We look forward to hearing from you. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Michael. And uh, good morning, everybody. I'm really uh, pleased to be here. Um, and I've also enjoyed hearing from um, both uh, Peter and Anthony, certainly listening to Peter's potted history of the last uh, 20 years. I feel like I've lived through every minute of it. And so I've been reliving it today. 
Um, going third has its advantages and disadvantages. Um, on the one hand, there's a fear that um, those who've gone before have stolen all the good lines. But on the other hand, there's possibly a chance to respond to some of what they have said. Um, so I want to pick up on uh, three themes today. The slides have just gone a little bit odd. Uh, I think if, if we could get them back into uh, into slideshow view. Um, I don't think I can do that, but it's all disappeared. Anyway, I'll carry on because um, you can certainly see the picture at the very least. Uh, oh, thank you. That's brilliant. Um, so I want to pick up on uh, three themes today. Things we know to be true about the uh, energy retail market uh, or market myths and market changes. What you might call the uh, the state we're in, the health of the market, and uh, finally what the future looks like. Um, this doesn't look like my slides. This all worked so well in rehearsal. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what's gone on here. Can we uh, can we get my slides back or have they disappeared? Ah, there we are. Brilliant. That's the one we want. Um, I'm not sure if I've got control or if the Energy Institute has, but um, if it's not me, I will. Ah, right. I'm being offered control. Excellent. OK, so let's uh, let's start. So when I first looked at this slide, um, I did a bit of a double take as I thought that we'd put two charts on the page with uh, different scales, but actually the scale is exactly the same and just shows the extent of change that we've seen in the market in those nine years. Uh, this is a slide that dispels a myth that seems to hang on extraordinarily stubbornly that it's all about six large players in the market. Even as recently as uh, Ofgem's 2019 State of the Market report, which was released in quarter four last year, whilst they acknowledged the existence of 60 players in the market, there were myriad references to the six largest suppliers. So much so, actually, that it was a point I brought out in the Q&A afterwards. The right hand chart shows the truth of this. The shape of the market has changed, the concentration has changed, even the names in the market have changed, with a number of those traditional ex-incumbents having effectively disappeared, either seeing no future in the market and selling out of it, or not really having a viable option to stay in it. And at the same time, it's about the success of some newer entrant players some old new entrants and some new new entrants, but including some now very well-known names in the market. So we're looking here at a market with 12 sizable players in it, or eight very substantial players. Let us never again hear reference in energy to an adjective followed by a number six, unless you're talking electricity networks. Ah, good. So ooh, we've gone too far. Another thing uh, that we know to be true is that customers are dissatisfied with their energy supplier. Now, I'm not complacent about the numbers on this slide, and I do believe that we need to keep on improving and striving to do better. But what the numbers do show us is that about three quarters of consumers are satisfied with their supplier. And that's actually a quote from Ofgem's quarter one 2020 accent survey, where they comment that that's actually consistent with previous quarters. And similarly, around 71% of customers in that round of surveys were satisfied with their suppliers customer service. And as you see from the Ofcom survey on the right hand side, satisfaction in energy is very comparable to that in other similar or arguably a bit more sexy sectors. In March 2020, in Bayes's regular customer satisfaction tracker, we saw the highest level of people 
they, saying that they'd switched in the last year since the survey had begun in 2012. Now, I accept that COVID-19 has had an impact since then, but only earlier this week, Energy UK noted that switching was rising again. And indeed in June, 2020, the switching levels were higher than they were in June, 2019. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't think that switching is the be all and end all in this market. There should be more focus on other metrics because as it says on the slide, 75% of customers hadn't switched because they were actually happy with their current provider or contract. We want to build longer term relationships with customers who stay with us because they want to. Now, you can't talk about a changing retail market without looking at the changing world that we're all living in. The energy sector's response to COVID, and thank you to Anthony for the acknowledgement of that, it has helped with that other thing that we're supposed to know to be true around the low level of trust in the industry. This is a difficult one, and it always reminds me of a visit that we had to our offices from one of the Leicester MPs. We talked about trust then, and his comment was that this is where you can see a big difference between the individual and the collective. So if you ask, do you trust MPs, then you may well get a general thumbs down. But if you ask, do you trust your own MP, you're much more likely to get a positive response. Yeah, he's a really good person, she's great. They do loads for the community. So also in my view is the case with energy companies. So whilst I'd like to see a higher trust number than that shown in the Bayes 2019 research and quoted on the slide, I'm much more encouraged by the more recent numbers. So 67% of customers saying they trust their energy supplier will help them during COVID, rising to over 80% for the over 65s. And interestingly, in conversations that I had with the Money Advice Trust earlier this week, statistics from the respondents to their survey revealed that energy suppliers were the second largest group after Universal Credit from whom those responding had sought support. Now, our own Net Promoter Score showed a similar picture during COVID, rising 15 points on the previous 10-week average, whilst our in-the-moment heartbeat scores, and those are when we phone somebody back immediately after uh, our advisor has had a, a conversation with them, those rose strongly on both the residential and the business side. And on the bottom right of the slide, I've just put in a quote that's just one quote from that time. Our aim was to deliver clear and helpful messages, advice and support to our millions of residential and business customers, offering them what they needed at that time. Another thing we know to be true, or we did before we listened to Peter, was is that energy suppliers make loads of money. However, that's not the picture we see here. The message on the slide is very clear and stark and predates COVID. 75% of domestic customers are with suppliers who are loss making. As I said on an off gem call recently, you have to look very hard to find a supplier making any money in the residential market at the moment. And the pattern of suppliers pricing below cost, as Peter again referred to, in order to grow is still very much in evidence. So it's not surprising that suppliers such as Angie left the domestic market through selling out of it. And that others such as Vattenfall's CEO, Magnus Hall commented last year that it was considering withdrawing from the market two and a half years after entering it because the market is, and I quote, quite the mess and very difficult. And as I say, this was all before COVID hit. 
and I've highlighted on the right hand side of the slide some of the new factors that COVID has brought with it that have made things even more difficult. And Anthony referred to some of these. He called it a double whammy. We think of it actually as a triple whammy because you have had lower volume in the market, so you're not earning any return on those units. You've got you've had to sell back into a depressed market, and you've also got industry costs which have been assumed to have been spread over a certain number of units and therefore priced accordingly, and then those units have not been sold. And of course, let's not forget that in the uh, energy market, it is the electricity suppliers who have to pick up the costs on behalf of the whole of the industry from customers, whether or not they've received that money themselves. And finally, Anthony referred to this as well. We don't know the extent to which the debt we're seeing at the moment is going to crystallize into bad debt. This situation just can't continue. We need to see a paradigm shift in the market. There cannot be a continuing expectation of very high investment when there are no or negative returns. To my mind, the risk reward balance in this market has gone out of sync. There is an expectation that we will invest millions, for example, in smart, and be at risk of 10% of turnover fines, but companies are struggling to make any money at all. So, against that rather gloomy picture, which I think we've heard quite a bit of in what Peter and Anthony said as well, it's not surprising that I'm hoping for a better tomorrow. In the same way as government is looking to build and grow our way out of what keeps being described as the deepest contraction since 1706, so also does it present an opportunity for energy suppliers and their customers. We put together a five-step plan for a green economic recovery, which we've shared with government, Ofgem, MPs and others and which we've been talking to them about. It's totally aligned with EON's purpose, which you can see on the bottom left of the slide. And we believe it would be positive for the country, our customers, and also clearly, we hope, for us. Because as I, I think I first heard uh, Chris Stark of the um, Climate Change Committee say this, right in the middle of lockdown, everything has changed, but nothing has changed. Whilst at that time we were seeing enormous reductions in energy use, a vast contraction of output and very few examples of motorised transport of any sort going anywhere, we also saw a corresponding reduction in emissions. But unless that signifies lasting change on what you might call sticky behaviours, little will ultimately change. And also, we don't want some of it to stick. We want to find new low carbon ways of doing some of the stuff that we were doing before. And that's what our paper was about, starting with changing the balance of probability on customers taking smart meters by making them opt out instead of opt in. And I was really interested with our, Anthony's comments here about smart pay as you go. Completely agree. And if we can change that, uh, that ethos, that, that onus, then I think we can really help get people onto smart prepayment rather than dumb prepayment. Um, and then the paper also dealt with energy efficiency, low carbon heat options, electric vehicles, and the tax levers that will help us move towards net zero. And of course, we've already seen some good news on energy efficiency, at least. So when we used to talk about energy suppliers, and Peter touched on this, it was usually about companies who sold commodity and who maybe did some boilers and energy efficiency on the side, if you like. I think where we've moved to is a very different place. And as this picture suggests, the future of retail is everything, what you might call commodity plus plus. Yes, it still does involve the sale of electricity and gas, clearly, but there is so much more. 
Um, for business customers, this has been the situation for a while at the larger end of the market with customers investing in everything from on-site generation through selling their flexibility to the system to building energy management systems and the like. But there's also growing engagement at the smaller end of the market too, with more customers producing and storing their own energy, for example, with solar and battery. The rise in electric vehicle ownership, in our view, can act as a catalyst towards people having much greater engagement with their energy. EVs are desire purchases rather than grudge purchases. And so we think of them as potentially being like the iPhone of electricity that suddenly makes people engage with and think about how and when they consume it. So unlike those large six, six large players of the past, who many accused of looking the same and acting the same, the future of energy retail is not a one size fits all solution. That's why we talk about the energy of the future as being smart, as being of course sustainable, but very definitely personalized. Thank you. And I'll hand back to Michael. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. Uh, I don't have any questions of clarification yet. I'll uh, hesitate to uh, see if any come in. Uh, while I'm doing that, uh, I guess I refer back to a very interesting set of slides indeed, which uh, all the audience will be able to have access to. Uh, I think uh, we're encouraged to avoid any phrase in which an adjective reflecting size and a number between five and seven occurs. There was an interesting slide on trust and satisfaction. And for me, the standout line was that 75% of domestic customers are with suppliers who are loss making an issue which uh, COVID uh, only uh, makes uh, worse. There is one clarif question, cl clarification question. Um, uh, at least I think it's a clarification, but we'll, we'll ask it anyway. It's from John Bird. Hello, John, who's an associate of Sust Sustainability First, and he wants to know, are many suppliers offering smart tariffs now, Sarah? I think uh, he'd had a smart meter for three years and he's yet to be offered a smart tariff from my supplier. Do you, do you want to clarify this point about the connection between smart tariffs and smart meters? Yes, absolutely. Um, smart tariffs are clearly something that you can uh, begin to offer once people have smart meters. I think it's fair to say that at the moment it's um, just a sort of a, a, a toe in the water of doing that. Um, because until we end up in a situation where we've got a market wide half hourly settlement and we can really get differential pricing across the market, then um, the the scope for having um, time of use tariffs is, is reduced. It's not not there, because if you look at what we've had in the past, like economy seven, economy 10, those are time of use tariffs. They're not just not very smart time of use tariffs. So I think John is right. Uh, it's very early days. Um, there are uh, smart tariffs out there. Um, I'm hoping he's not an E.ON customer. We do have smart tariffs, so uh, we've either not uh, uh, advertised them well enough to him, but otherwise I would suggest, John, that you look around and, uh, and, and you know, see if you can find the tariff you're looking for, because there are some out there. Thank you very much, Sarah. And if I may be permitted to add from the chair and indeed on behalf of Alexon, the reference there to uh, market-wide half-hourly settlement is absolutely key to making smart tariffs smarter and more uh, more prevalent. Uh, it really does make a, a lot of sense of the smart meter rollout when you have half-hourly settlement attached to it. So I'd like to move on now formally to the uh, panel session. Uh, and uh, uh, questions are invited, uh, and uh, I'll make sure that they are passed on to the speakers. If you do wish to identify a particular speaker, uh, then uh, please do so, and I'll direct it accordingly. If you want to simply toss it into the 
panel and see what happens to it, then that's also fine. I will get the uh, the ball rolling uh, with a question, I think probably starting with Anthony. Um, and the question is this, I mean, from a number of speakers, there's a message that's growing here, isn't there? Uh, there's been reference to the demise of a, a number of suppliers recently. Uh, there wasn't reference, though there might well have been, to a very large number of job losses in the energy retail business recently. And as I said just now, the evidence of 75% of domestic suppliers with loss making, uh, of customers with loss making suppliers. That doesn't sound to me like sustainability. It's therefore not satisfactory. I invite the panel to comment on what, if anything, they think should be done about it and by whom? Starting with Peter, I think. Sorry, but with Peter. It's a great question. I'm I'm always torn on this one. I must admit, because uh, on the one hand, um, clearly um, it has led to um, some bad outcomes for investors, um, and a lot of capital has been burnt through. Um, has it led to bad outcomes for consumers? Well, as I mentioned, effectively what we've been seeing is a significant transfer of wealth from shareholders to consumers, and of course the mechanisms Ofgen have in place means that when companies go bust, consumers don't particularly suffer from from that. I think um, in the long term, though, it's bound to be detrimental to a point because, um, as Sarah was uh, pointing out, you know, this is an industry that will require considerable investment um, uh, and quite a lot of risk taking. Uh, and if you are a market where nobody can make a decent return, then the appetite to take that risk uh, and invest is going to be uh, obviously significantly diminished, if not go away. So, so ultimately, you'll end up in a situation where the market sort of stagnates um, uh, and doesn't move forward as fast as it otherwise, otherwise, otherwise could, could do, and that would be uh, detrimental to consumers. Have we seen that so far? I mean, that's, you know, it's a very, very, very interesting debate, and I think it will depend very much on, on which company you happen to work for and which side of that debate you come down to down on, but I certainly it's, it's a significant risk um, uh, going forward. So I'd just like to press you one, one, one step further, uh, uh, Peter, because essentially what I'm hearing from you is, well, this is a market and the market's very competitive and it's got so competitive that people aren't making money in it. Um, now, normal markets do recover in time uh, with a certain amount of uh, disruption on the way. Do you think, because you haven't mentioned it, anything uh, should be done by the regulator in this respect? Uh, no, I think the barriers to entry have been um, very, very unusually low. Um, and I often have, have a program in place, as we all know, to to lift the barriers to entry. To, they perhaps they wouldn't quite describe it in that in that way, but that's effectively what they're doing, um, requiring. A, a, a more hurdles and higher hurdles for potential new entrants to step to step over, and I think that's you know definitely um, a step in a step in the right direction. But I think you know, like I mean, people are going to be writing you know um, PhD uh, dissertations on the energy supply market over the next few years to sort of answer this very very question. You know, you know, this explosion of competition in the market of the last five years, who did benefit? Um, but what, what I think we can set, set, safely say it's unsustainable, um, I, and the appetites of shareholders to see their capital burn through um, is already declining substantially, both at the large end and at the small end. Um, and I think there is a natural. You know, the, the main way to control this, at the end of the day, is is, is for shareholders to stop providing the capital. Um, and, and if you want me to answer the question about well, why they've been providing the capital until now, I can I can have a stab at that. But um, you know, the main control, frankly, is from from the capital markets and and shareholders to stop providing capital to demonstrably loss making businesses that have very 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 little chance of ever turning a significant profit and return on profit, uh, return on capital. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and one one final uh, follow up question, which <clears throat> isn't along the lines of the last one, <clears throat> but it arises from your remarks, your memorable remarks about Ponzi companies. It's from the floor, so I'll ask it now, <clears throat> then move on to Sarah with the original question, finishing up with Anthony. 
the question from the floor is, if these Ponzi companies are not viable, who will pick up the costs when they go bust? Well, the, 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 the shareholders who have provided the capital are the ones who will ultimately uh, uh, significantly lose out. Um, but, you know, the, some of these companies could well go bust with, you know, very, very substantial creditor positions, um, which the rest of the industry will ultimately have to pick up. So I mean, there is a real moral hazard. I mean, the, the off-gen um, uh, mechanisms for companies taking over companies, I think is a very good one in, in the sense of protecting customers, but it, but, you know, it does create a substantial moral hazard um, for companies to just basically go for growth if it doesn't work out. You know, the shareholders lose the money for sure. Um, uh, management teams have been paid pretty well in between time. Um, and uh, in terms of the, the, the sort of the wider obligations in the industry, like the RO and things and, and customer balances is picked up by other people. Okay, thank you, Peter. Now I'm gonna keep to the original question, which is it's an unsustainable market, Sarah, the way you described it. Uh, what do you think is the solution to the problem that you have so clearly uh, described? It's unsustainable, it's unsatisfactory, what should be done and by whom to correct the problems you've identified? Sara. Thank you. Um, I think the uh, the first thing that, and, and I touched on this to, to some degree in, the, in my presentation, is we really need to sort of change the rhetoric and change the way that we perceive the market. Because I think one of these things that are known to be true is that uh, all of the uh, older ex-incumbent players are sort of by definition inefficient and have been making too much money. And I think that that is, is absolutely not true because what it fails to recognize is something that was, I'm very pleased to say, finally recognized in the joint Ofgem and Bayes uh, future retail energy market paper, which came out, I think, last summer. And in that paper, they recognized that the uh, impact of the lack of a level playing field in the market, and in particular, the fact that uh, the, the smaller end of the market, the players did not, uh, were, had exemptions from things like eco and the warm homes discount, had created a fundamental distortion in the market, which had meant that uh, suppliers who were subject to those obligations had no choice but to recover those costs from the, the 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 customers who didn't move. So you know you you can call it a loyalty penalty, or you can just call it being sort of cut stuck in a cleft stick where you can't recover it at the bottom end of the market because those prices are below cost. Uh, uh, sort of as as already discussed. So I think the first thing you need to do is that you need to level up that framework so that there are no uh, exemptions at all, at, at whatever level, so that people are competing on a, on a level playing field. Similarly, I think there's been a failure to recognize that not all customers are equal. There are some customers who are really very cheap to serve because they, they, don't, they don't ring in, they don't uh, get in touch, they don't they don't have a problem. They just they pay by direct debits. They come in for a year and then they go out again. Uh, whereas there are other customers who, rightly so, need more support from um, from their energy supplier. And many of those customers sit with the more traditional ex incumbent players. The ratio is about one to four if one looks at it, one to three or one to four, depending on, on the company, if one looks at the, the numbers on priority services register. And I think that insufficient attention is given to that. Um, and therefore, I would like that also to be acknowledged and to be recognized in the market. And if possible, actually, what I would like to see is some sort of uh, levelization mechanism to reflect that. Because what it's, it's not enough to um, to sort of put the top of the market up in order for you know companies to be able to make more money. To Peter's point, um, you know customers have benefited from this. But what we do need is we need to bring the bottom up so that that gap reduces. And the only way to bring the bottom up is if people 
are effectively made to reflect the true costs of operating in the market, which they're not doing at the moment. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Sarah. So, uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to pass the, the essential original question on to Anthony, who from a, a regulatory point of view, uh, obviously can't be uh, pleased that the uh, current position is unsustainable. Uh, could you make some comments on on what your view of the market currently, as described by Sarah and Peter in particular, is, and what, if anything, you feel should be done about it? Anthony. Mm, thank you. Ultimately, a lot of what's happening in the market currently is driven by the fact we have a price cap in place. That price cap set by us um, to be an efficient price. That's how we set it up when we started. Now that has led to companies having to make cost savings uh, and that has led to job losses. Nobody likes job losses and it's really regrettable job losses have to take place. Why is the price cap in place? Well the price cap was introduced by primary legislation by government and I think, personal view, it represents um, the political classes losing losing trust in suppliers to provide a fair price for customers. Uh, if you go back a few years, we were talking about the uh, the jams, so just about managings, um, and there was a change in zeitgeist a few years ago to move away from uh, well, people can shop around to people shouldn't have to sh shop around. The differentials we saw between standard variable tariffs, pre-price cap, and and um, uh, competitive tariffs was very large, and I think there was a loss in trust in the market to look after customers in that way. That's why I think it was put in place. What can happen going forward? Well, um, companies are becoming more efficient um, and more effective at what they do. Um, the, the onus has to be on adding value and being trusted companies. And I think some companies have made really good strides in that way. Um, it's about having a strong business model. And for those companies, this market can be sustainable. We are going through a really difficult period at the moment with COVID, but we will come out of that and you will find some companies go out of business, but some customer, companies will come through stronger and better. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, I, I guess uh, uh, what I want to add is a question from the audience uh, relevant to the price cap. The question from the audience is what impact will the new price cap have on the wider market and raising capital to fund infrastructure development necessary to advance towards net zero? Can you also perhaps comment on uh, what you think may be the case with regard to the future of the price cap? We think, uh, I think it's August, unless that's been postponed, that uh, uh, Ofgem have to give a, a view, which presumably will be a public view, on the future of the price cap. Would you like to comment further on the price cap that you've mentioned? Uh, so, uh, in August, we will publish the next level of the price cap, um, which is um, uh, to come into force on the 1st of October. Uh, that is a mechanistic process which is based on um, a series of costs, including wholesale costs. Wholesale costs has gone down in the last few months fairly dramatically, so we can expect the price cap in some shape or form to be lower. I don't know exactly what it will be yet because uh, the data goes through to the end of July and we haven't reached the end of July yet, so we'll have clarity probably only a couple of days before the announcement. The, um, the price cap more generally um, it has a sunset clause of 2023. We have to make uh, annual recommendations from 2020 onwards as to whether the conditions for lifting the cap are in place. We will make that first recommendation to the Secretary of State later this year. I, I can't tell you what that recommendation will be. It will have to go to the Secretary of State first, I'm afraid. Just clarifying the last point, it was the more general advice to the Secretary of State on the future of the price cap that I was thinking about. Uh, and I thought that was due in August. Uh, has, has that, is that not the case? Uh, yeah, I believe it is due in August, but um, I still, I'm, I'm afraid, can't share it with you today what we're likely to say. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, so let's uh, let's move on. Thank you for that. Um, and there's a question uh, again from the uh, uh, from the from the floor. Uh, let's take the one from Charles Wheeler of Get Economics. Is there much evidence of the retail consumer being prepared to pay more for differentiated services? His impression is that consumers are just looking for flexibility to reduce costs. So it's an interesting question regarding the the added value of extra services, uh, which perhaps may be a, well, a way through for many suppliers. Uh, again, let's uh, let's let's start with Peter and go via Sarah back to Anthony. We'll keep the same sequence for the time being. Peter, do you want to comment on that question about uh, added services? I, I, to be honest, I the Sarah in particular is way better uh, to answer this question for me. I think it's a great question, and I personally suspect not, uh, but I have no um, no evidence or expertise to uh, to back that up. Uh, looks like um, it's over to you, Sarah. Yeah, it is. It's a it's a very good question. Um, I think that the 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 basic answer is no, not really. Um, so, so Peter's instincts, having been in the market for a long time, are are absolutely right. Um, I think that if you if you look at um, at the sort of history in the market, there are some there are some markets where you have seen you know here is the Rolls Royce uh, service that you can be offered, and here is your and I'll probably offend somebody here, but you know here's your Skoda service. And and really that that hasn't taken off in energy and it and it doesn't really work because it's it's quite hard to differentiate between your Rolls Royce and your Skoda within energy, particularly when under the uh, regulatory regime um, you actually have to uh, be easy to contact. You have to provide various different channels to contact um, the supplier. Um, and and therefore you can't just say oh well we're not going to use that one because it's it's too expensive. I think the the sort of one uh, area where people are sometimes prepared to pay more is for a, a sort of reassurance type product. So it's not about service; it's in the nature of the product that you're offering, where the supplier is taking the risk of something. So for a, a bit like a an all you can eat buffet type of uh, product where you can guarantee that the customer, for example, will stay warm throughout the winter, then in those circumstances that might cost a bit more, but the uh, the the benefit to the customer is in terms of, of having that reassurance that they know what they're going to pay, they know that they can stay warm. So those are the sort of differentiated services I would think about. And then obviously we talked earlier about, about tariffs um, things like time of use tariffs, electric vehicle charging tariffs, etc. Um, they are a differentiated service, but they would be priced effectively according to their cost rather than as a premium or as a as a paired back service. That's what I'd say. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Anthony, do you have uh, a view on this question about uh, the willingness to pay for differentiated additional services? So um, I think I'm largely in agreement with previous speakers. The, the uh, generally speaking, from survey evidence that I've seen, um, people who switch supplier predominantly, very predominantly, switch because of price. Um, so that kind of suggests that uh, if you want to do value-added services, you need to somehow keep people. So it's all about trust again. Um, I mean, uh, I think Sarah is right. Her analogy about um, Rolls Royces and um, I'll use the example of Skoda um, because energy is it is the equivalent of it's not equivalent of a Rolls Royce or a Skoda, but it's the it's the diesel that goes into the Rolls Royce and the diesel that goes into a Skoda. It is um, it is a facilitating product energy in that in that respect. So it's quite hard to to make people get terribly excited about it. Um, present can be accepted, obviously. Um, so I think it's really about trusting the market and then reacting to those um, uh, services when they're offered. Thank you, Anthony. While I have you on screen, uh, there's a question in from Dean Somerville. 
which relates to uh, the half hourly settlement point that was raised earlier on, which indeed is a is a way of achieving more differentiation, at least in the tariff itself, in smart tariffs. Uh, so the question is, do you have an estimated time scale on when market wide half hourly settlement will be available for domestic customers? Do you have a view on that? Um, so uh, sadly for you, I'm probably not the right person in, in Ofgen to ask on this. We may have a date, but if we do, I'm afraid I don't know it. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I, I quite like to ensure that Dean some of them gets an answer to that. So outside the meeting, uh, we'll ensure that uh, a message gets back uh, 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 and, and one that, uh, that Ofgem are, are happy to put their names to. So uh, moving on to Jeremy Nicholson. Hello, Jeremy. His question is related to the previous ones. How will suppliers be affected by rising policy costs, some of which have been deferred during the COVID crisis? At some stage, these will have to be recovered. Could these trigger further failures and consolidation in the supply market? Uh, let's let's go to Sarah and then to uh, uh, to Peter. Back to Anthony. Sarah, do you have a view on deferred policy costs? Uh, yes, and yes. <laughs> That's that's the very short answer. But no, I mean, Jeremy, you're spot on, as I would expect, with it you, being you, Jeremy. Um, but and and I think it, it's something I touched on um, on on one of my slides. Um, as I said, for, I mean, you've got two issues. One, you've got the policy costs that should have been recovered um, over the the sort of period where the volume really fell and just haven't been. And those are a charge, they're a cost to the supplier, which the supplier is going to have to bear because they, they can't be recovered. Um, we've then had the very actually positive um, uh, approach by uh, by government to, for example, defer um, some of the, the, the LC, LCCC um, increases and then the um, the changes uh, with the with the national grid balancing uh, costs as well, um, but at some point they will have to be recovered. So they will be costs that are uh, are additional to what one would have expected. So if you're doing your midterm plan at the moment, then it's showing a much heavier um, uh, whack of of cost in in those industry costs than than otherwise. So yeah, I think there is a risk. Um, that some people will just find that they they can't meet those, and that it may lead to further supplier failure. Okay, I I will go to Anthony on that question, uh, but before I do, I just thought we ought to add in while we have you on the screen, Sarah, uh, the question from Paul S, whoever Paul S is, uh, where uh, there's reference to uh, being clear on green tariffs. I think Anthony made that point. Sarah, do you think that customers understand and buy in to the current practice and use of certificates? How should practice evolve? That's from Paul. Um, I, I, this, I, this is a big issue at the moment, and, and I think it is important that customers should always understand what they're buying and that when they are buying green energy, they should understand whether what they are actually getting there is something that is backed by a rego so it is just a certificated green energy or if there's actually a an underlying power purchase agreement a ppa um, that that sort of stands behind either the whole or part of that energy so from an eon perspective for example ours is a is a mixture of certificates and power purchase agreements and in many cases it relates to assets that we actually built in the first place um, so there are very very many different approaches um, and it is important that customers understand it um, whether they do currently i think is a good question we try to be very clear about it um, but i'm not sure that necessarily every customer will understand the subtleties i think that's right okay thanks for answering that one just want to return then to anthony to see if he's got any comments on yes i think it was jeremy's question about the effect of deferred policy costs uh, particularly in the context, I guess, of the announcement of the next price cap. Anthony, do you want to comment on that question and Sarah's comments? 
Um, so I think uh, deferring policy costs, yes, they have to be paid back. Um, and yes, that does mean that ultimately suppliers are going to have to find the money. Um, as with we, as we have seen with over the last couple of years with the renewables obligation, when a large amount of money falls to you at a fixed point in time, um, we find that some suppliers are unable to deal with that. So it is possible that um, by deferring policy costs, um, some suppliers um, may make use of that and then find that actually when push comes to shove, they're unable to pay it back. That is possible. We hope that won't be the case, but it is it, it is possible. Um, I should say that um, by the miracles of modern technology, I think I have an answer to Drew's question um, on half hourly settlement um, since the off-chain system has finally started working again. Um, so you asked about the um, timeline for half hourly settlements, and I'm told that we proposed, uh, we're, we're consulting at the moment, we proposed a four-year transition starting sometime in 2021, which will give us an end point in 2025, but we are at the moment uh, assessing the impact of COVID on that. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Anthony. Uh, I notice we've got 10 minutes or just less than 10 minutes to go, so I feel I ought to move the debate on to uh, an issue that we haven't debated as such uh, for the last nine minutes, and that's the issue of getting to net zero. And there are a number of questions on that. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of Gemma Williams's question, which is the UK's transition to net zero is likely to require large amounts of capital investment in the market uh, to enhance both physical and digital infrastructure. Will the profit making capacity of the industry be squeezed by regulatory reforms, price caps and so on? Uh, so uh, I will go to uh, to uh, uh, Anthony, sorry, to Peter on that first, but before I do, there was a, an earlier question also on net zero. So let's put them together. It's um, Harry Cripps's question is, uh, what changes to the market are required to optimize progress towards net zero 2050? Is the present market fit for purpose? Uh, and the, uh, I guess the, the final limb of this question about net zero, and then we'll go around the panel uh, and deal with net zero fully, uh, my, my own version of the question is, customers need to be incentivized. I assume people will agree to change their behaviors to achieve net zero. There hasn't been very much change of behavior, uh, at, least, at least that's my instinct. Uh, what changes in behaviors of customers are required and who or how will they be incentivized? So there's three different approaches to the same issue, which how do we get to net zero? And we'll go in the order from uh, Peter to uh, Sarah to Anthony finishing up again, uh, and then we're done. Uh, so say all you want to about getting to net zero, starting with Peter and particular emphasis on the capital requirements. Peter. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. And um, if we look at the, the uh, just the state of electricity at the moment, um, who's making money? So thermal generators are making no money. In fact, they're making losses. Uh, nuclear generators currently making very little, if any, money, probably losses, um, certainly in the COVID uh, period. But even before that, uh, we're seeing you know considerable pressure on their profits. Uh, and as Sarah pointed out, 75% of suppliers or the, the customer base of the supply group are also uh, currently loss making. The only people currently making any money in the in the in the um, in the sector is uh, renewable generators. They of course, had. Um, uh, you know, many, 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 many billions of pounds of uh, cash thrown at them um, over the last uh, few years. So they're sort of fine. And I think the, the government's view is that um, you know, that's a great success. We've been able to incentivize the, the build out renewables by frankly throwing an awful lot of money at it, but we've been able to do that. And they've not been too worried about the rest of the sector um, not making any money. We've also seen just very recently, of course, a real crackdown on returns or proposed returns in, in the network as well. So the Rio 2 proposals that came out a couple of days ago from Ofgen for, um, for transmission, both gas and electricity, um, were frankly brutal. Um, maybe justifiably so, but nevertheless brutal. Um, you know, with a cost of equity of below 4%. And a differential in TOTEX allowance between what National Grid was asking for for electricity transmission and what Ofgen had given them of 47%, uh, which is also down 
something like 35, 38% from the current allowance. Um, so you are seeing this sort of you know, slightly odd situation where one bit of the industry is very profitable. And therefore, uh, you know, as long as the regime surrounding that remains fairly stable, certainly won't have any problem attracting capital. Um, with the rest of the, su the sort of supply chain really, really struggling. Does that matter? Um, policymakers obviously were looking at that and saying, well, you know, it doesn't really matter if we squeeze the network up, it doesn't really matter if the most of the suppliers don't make any money. Is the investment going to be coming from left center? Is it going to come from Amazon? Is it going to come from Google? Is it going to come from, um, you know, the, the big energy majors? Or are those are the people who are going to be, is it lots of startups, AI startups, you know, fintech type businesses? Are they going to be coming in and solving it? It really, frankly, matters not whether Eon withers on the vine because Eon is a whole old, nasty legacy operation. Um, and that may well be true. I mean, you know, uh, to some degree, you can say what well, has been true over the last, <laughs> you know, it's been true over the last few years. You know, the, the, the big, if you go back to 2010, those big dominant utility companies, not just in supply, but across the sector, have been largely, dis or have been significantly displaced by other players who've come in and done what they um, uh, were sort of uh, expected to do. I think it's a risk, uh, and I think uh, you know policymakers should be paying a lot more attention to the various bits of the industry that are that are actually, um, at the very least, um, uh, crucial to facilitate all this new technology, all this new innovation, and providing the backbone of it. I think if you allow the backbone, the unseen backbone, the sort of network that upon which everything else sits, to uh, to wither away um, and be underinvested in, then you do, then you are you are running risk. But it is, you know, um, uh, you know, if I was sitting in number 10's policy unit at the moment, this is actually one of the biggest things I'd be thinking about. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. I think we need to move rapidly to Sarah and offer her the right of response to your remarks <laughs> about the possible prospects for Eon. Uh, yeah. The question is centrally about net zero, the capital requirements, behaviours and so on. Okay, so uh, I'll just just to to respond very briefly, the last time I sat in a room with um, government who said, "Oh well, it really doesn't matter if you don't want to do it, uh, Eon, because we've got loads and loads of other people who are queuing up to do it," was in relation to the Green Deal, and we know how much of a success that was. Um, but moving on to to net zero and sort of trying to pick up on the on the customer and and the the company piece. I think from a customer perspective, it's all about incentives to uh, to change behavior or regulation to effectively force change of behavior. So these are things like um, changing housing standards, um, boiler scrappage schemes, uh, vehicle scrappage schemes, and sort of the flip side of that is things like incentives that will make uh, heat pumps affordable for people that will make uh, uh, electric vehicles affordable for people. So you have to have that balance between making one thing bad and another thing good and positive. And once you get that sort of framework in place and you create the pull from uh, customers, whether they be domestic customers or whether they be uh, industrial customers, then companies will come in if there is you know, an opportunity for them to make some money out of that framework. So it's, it's a balance between the, the different factors, I would say very briefly, and very important that we should get it right. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and that brings us finally to Anthony for uh, remarks on net zero. Uh, the, the Ofgem has made it very, very clear how important a priority it is. Could you say more about how you think the key issues that will need to uh, make it change. Thank you. So we, we have a, a brand new strategy and decarbonisation team. They're the experts on this area. Let me just make a couple of high level points. First one is, is really building on Sarah's point, which is that the first thing is that uh, we've got in this country uh, an awful lot of really poor housing stock, which is very poorly insulated and very poorly uh, and very inefficient. Um, you know, we've had eco and uh, predecessor schemes looking to um, improve um, insulation in housing stock. 
they've made some good progress, but it's really only scratching the surface. There's a lot more needs to be done to make the housing stock fit for purpose in this country, which will make a it will make a great start in reducing energy usage. When it comes to um, net zero and changing behaviours, I think at this point in time, what we see is that it's really all about the uh, energy intensive uses. So it's, if you've got an electric vehicle, if you've got electric heating, then actually time of use tariffs and, and such like um, can make a difference and you can save money um, by shifting um, demand uh, to different times of day. If you don't have either of those at this point in time, actually, there's probably no benefit for you in moving to time of use tariffs. So we're going to be in that position for really quite a long time. It's about getting the change in behaviour for those people for whom it can benefit. So if, you, if people have got an electric vehicle, if they've got electric heating, try and make sure that they make best use of those in a way that moves us towards net zero, send out messages to them. There's going to be a lot of people who for a long time are not going to benefit from these and we have to um, make sure they are also um, protected. Thank you very much indeed, Anthony. Thank you for being uh, concise. As we finish at 12.01, I thank you uh, all. I can thank the people who have attended. Over 50 at one point and 43 or 45 of you have stayed the distance. Thank you to all for your questions. Apologies for those whose questions we didn't get around to. I think it's been a very interesting and useful morning to which, uh, th therefore, we owe great gratitude to the three speakers, to Peter Atherton, to Anthony Pygram, and Sarah Vaughan, who made it such a successful morning. Thank you, all three. And I'm sorry you can't hear the thunderous applause, which is currently ringing around the internet. Uh, <laughs> finally, uh, can I just say, <laughs> our, next, our next event is on the 3rd of December. Uh, when we will be having the title of Energy Priorities for 2021 as our theme. The Minister has been invited. Uh, Emma Pinchbeck, the, uh, the new uh, newly arriving Chief Executive of Energy UK, is a confirmed speaker and uh, a senior speaker from the... Uh, ...has been invited as well. So that should be a very interesting uh, session. Looking forward to 2021, which of course includes COP. So once again, thank you to everybody. Uh, I think the Energy Institute would like you to complete an evaluation form. I have no idea how you'll get it, but I'm sure they'll get it to you if it's not already on screen. And a final thanks from me to you all, and in particular to our speakers. Thank you all, and goodbye for now. <laughs>